welcome to Words and Pictures, Working Together, Visual Literacy and Analyzing Graphic Texts with Students. Today we have a wonderful group of educators and experts that are going to talk about reading graphic text with students and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves as we go. So, uh, Derek, would you like to go first? Sure. I'm Derek Hyde. I work out here in Temecula, California at Temecula Valley High School as an English language arts teacher for the ninth grade level. I'm also teaching AP Literature Comp. And starting this coming year, I'll be teaching Critical Studies and Comics, a comics-focused class that I've been working on writing and getting implemented in my curriculum. And congratulations on that. I know that was a long process to get that approved. Yeah, it took about six, seven years to get it going, but we're there. We got there. That's exciting. Thank you very much. And Trevor, Trevor Bryan. Hi, uh, my name is Trevor Bryan. I am an art teacher from New Jersey. I've been teaching art for 20 years. I am also the author of the book, The Art of Comprehension, which helps uh, utilize uh, uh, visual text in classrooms to teach comprehension. Um, and I really believe that using visual text helps to support all learners to learn to make meaning and develop the comprehension skills that they need, not only uh, to do well on, on tests, but also uh, just in life in general. Thank you very much, Trevor. And Shiveta, Shiveta Miller. Hello, I'm Shiveta. Um, I taught graphic novels, among other things, at the high school level, uh, mostly in New York City public schools. Uh, now I am a literacy consultant and I get to visit schools all over the country. Um, I have a book coming out next year on teaching graphic novels called Hacking Graphic Novels. And today I'll share with you a little bit from that book. Great, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to that. And Talia. Great, yeah, hi, uh, I'm Talia Hurwich. I'm a former middle school writing teacher. Uh, I am currently a doctoral candidate at NYU where I teach the philosophy of education using day tripper um, to undergraduates. Uh, and I have co-written a book with uh, Dr. Meryl Jaffe, Worth a Thousand Words. It's uh, for using graphic novels to teach visual and verbal literacy. And I look forward to speaking with you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Matt, I can tell you right now, the amount of talent and knowledge in this group is staggering. So we're <laughs> looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. I just wanted to start with, um, with a question for, for everyone. Um, why comics? Why the medium of comics and graphic novels? And what is it about the medium that has educational power um, that makes you want to use it with your students? You can just jump in there, anybody who wants to answer. Uh, for me, it's the increased relevance, especially in the world that we are in now, uh, not the COVID everyone's in their homes world necessarily, but the uh, recent and not so recent now influx of comics media everywhere uh, with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and with the CWs, Legends of Tomorrow and Supergirl and Stargirl. And I know that, and we know that comics are far more than just superhero comics, but the influx of that brand and that marketing into every facet of pop culture means that when we bring them into our classroom, we've got a means to communicate with our students in a way that is maybe a little bit more engaging inherently than a novel would be. This is something that they've perhaps picked up consciously of their own volition elsewhere. And now we get to use that to demonstrate that the stuff we're doing in the classroom is just as relevant outside of the classroom. So it's a nice bridging tool from the classroom to their real life. Great, thanks. Anybody else wanna tackle that real quick? Uh, I'll add to that. I, I feel the same as Derek um, in terms of the relevant. Uh, and I'll add for me, um, I, I started teaching graphic novels with the intent to teach rigorous close reading and text analysis, um, analyzing visual media the way that students are used to doing with prose um, and poetry. But over the years of, of doing it, I discovered a surprising outcome that now is really my driving motivation to continue teaching it, um, which is that with all reading, now I see more teaching reading as a tool. Um, we read so that we can write. We read so that we can express ourselves. 
Um, and so having students actually then take what they were learning about the medium and create their own stories um, is, now, is now really why I, I continue to do this work because I've seen that with this medium specifically, students are able to communicate truths about their lives and the world that they have not been able to do in prose or other, um, other forms of communication. So, uh, and, and again, in, in the world we live in, it's becoming increasingly important that we, in the classroom, build that relational trust with our students um, that will help them really pursue their own academic goals. And that trust comes from hearing their stories. And if we give them more and more tools to tell those stories in innovative and interesting ways, then uh, we can build that trust. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, for me as a, a, an arts educator um, and someone who, who dabbles in comprehension work, I think that visual text kind of level the playing, uh, uh, playing field for a lot of my students. In that in a K-5 building where we have kids that are reading at different levels, um, that presenting visual text and preventing, uh, presenting stories visually allows all students to engage in the meaning making process and allows them to, to share their voice in a way that if it was only written text, a lot of students would be left out of the conversation. So not only is it a way to help uh, students um, build um, different ways of sharing their stories, but it allows them to kind of literally share their voice within classrooms, which I think having robust conversations where we hear from all students and all voices is really where a lot of learning takes place. And so inviting kids into those conversations, I think is really valuable. Um, and then it's also allows kids who maybe aren't as proficient in terms of um, writing, you know, uh, prose, it, it gives them opportunities to share their stories um, in really unique ways. Um, and I find this especially true in K-5 settings. Great, thanks, Trevor. Sure. Um, and to just add to that to some degree, um, this is a fantastic, these are all like a thousand percent agreed. Um, but one of the things that I really love about comics and graphic novels is that students get very good at not simply learning content, but learning the teacher and learning what is expected of them. Um, and so in performance, they try to predict the teacher. And this is the kind of answer that I think a teacher would want as opposed to necessarily being more honest to what's going on internally um, with their comprehension. Uh, yeah, now okay. with, sorry? You're okay, keep going. Okay, okay. I, I thought that there was some freezing that happened there. Um, with with comics um because there is metaphor but it's not what you expect metaphor to be um it starts to jump over those expectations and you get to have them talking about things um in different ways and that creates new pathways new ways of understanding um and it's in a way that they're not necessarily bringing all of those emotions that they've built up as english students previously if they feel horrible about their ability to write an essay and you bring comics in your nonfiction lesson, um, they're not gonna think, oh my God, I have to write an essay. It's comics. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think every one of those, I mean, it, it, there are probably a hundred more reasons, but those are some of definitely some of the strongest reasons to use comics and graphic novels. Um, one of the things that I've run into a lot when I talk to teachers is, you know, I know how to, to teach a book. I know how to teach a novel. We have activities we do for that. I, we know how to analyze those. The teachers are very good at that. What they don't understand a lot of times is how to do that with the graphic text. Because in a graphic text, the words and the pictures carry the weight of the story together, and you have to look at the interplay between them. A lot of them don't understand the conventions of comics, panels and borders and balloons. I actually had someone who works in the industry tell me that they read an entire Batman story and someone asked them a question about it and they couldn't answer it because they hadn't looked at the pictures. They had just read the words. So 
I'm going to ask you now to give us a little bit about how you um, approach that analysis of graphic text um, with students. So I think we said, Trevor, you're going to go first, correct? Sure. Yes. Yep. Um, so I, I, I um, approach graphic novels and um, written stories, uh, picture books, um, whatever, whatever story format that I'm dealing with, whether it's a, even plays or musicals, I approach them all exactly the same in a lot of ways. Um, and the way that I help kids to enter into stories and begin to make meaning is through mood. And mood is how stories are told. It's a very effective way of entering into stories um, because as humans, that's how we connect. Uh, we connect to each other through moods, and we also connect through uh, characters uh, through moods. And so when we, when we start with the idea that all stories are told through moods, it gives us a very simple entrance point um, that most kids uh, can understand. All kids or most kids uh, have a good sense of what it means to be happy or excited or sad or isolated or left out or included. And so when we think about stories and we start with trying to figure out how a character is feeling, um, it gives us a really good entrance point into that story. Uh, the, the reason why mood is so powerful is because stories, regardless of the format, are basically made up of, of three ingredients. They have the events and the actions that take place, and then uh, they have the, the uh, reaction to those events or actions and the reasons for those uh, reactions to the events or actions. And so when we, when we start by thinking about stories with those three ingredients, we can apply that format to really any, um, any, any narrative, whether it's a, a fiction narrative, a nonfiction, um, because we're, we're always focusing on the, on the same things and we're doing that through mood. So the other advantage to entering stories through mood is that whether we're looking at pictures or whether we're reading words, the way that the creators of those stories are going to present those moods are very consistent. Um, we can look at facial expressions, we can look at body language and action, um, we can look at the colors that are being used, whether they're whether they're uh, the colors are being shown through words or whether they're being shown in the um, artwork or illustrations. We're going to see great consistency between all of these stories uh, because what the uh, the creators of these stories are really going to be showing are the moods of the characters. Um, we can also look at what characters are close to or far away from um, as a way of gauging mood. Are they close to things that make them feel safe? Are they um, close to things that make them feel scared or nervous? Um, are they close to uh, their dreams and their hopes or are they far away from these things? So looking at facial expressions and body language, colors, distance, whether characters are alone, and then um, also the sounds. Uh, what what sounds are being portrayed? Do we hear branches scratching a window? Do we see a word being shown like bang? Do we <clears throat> um, uh, how, how are characters speaking? Are they whispering? These are all things that we can look for, whether we're looking at illustrations or whether we're looking at um, more traditional written text or written stories. And these things not only help us to think about what the mood is of that character, but that's what's going to help us to comprehend the story. So we want to enter stories, um, again, regardless of the, of the narrative type, we want to enter through mood. We want to think about uh, the events for the, um, the actions that are taking place, how is the character responding to those events, which is really what the story is about, and the reasons for those uh, reactions. And if we can answer those three questions, we're gonna be in the heart of the story. And I'll just give you a quick example of why the reaction to certain events is so important. If I said, um, I woke up, I never felt so excited in my life, it was my birthday, we have an event, right, waking up. We have a reaction to the, that event, um, right, really excited. And we have a reason, it's my birthday. And as a, as a reader or as an audience member, though, because I know those three pieces of information, the story makes sense to me and my, my brain can kind of relax and enjoy the story. If we switch that up and I say, I woke up, I never felt so sad in my life, it was my, it's, 
it's my birthday. As an audience member, we don't quite understand why someone would be so sad on their birthday. And so we have the same event, the waking up, we have a different reaction. Um, and the reason for the reaction doesn't make sense. And so as an audience member, that's what we'd, we'd want to be looking for. We'd want to be looking at why would this person be so sad on their birthday? And I think that that little example illustrates how important mood is um, in, in the telling of stories. And so mood is a really good way to enter into any type of narrative. Again, whether it's um, a, a nonfiction text, whether it's a, a fiction text, whether it's a play, a song, um, a musical, a comic, or even a graphic novel. But it's a really simple way into te text. Um, get kids thinking about that, those moods. Get kids thinking about um, how those moods are being shown to, to, to think about craft. How, how is the creator crafting their story? And think about why characters are feeling that way. Um, and that's a really powerful way to get all kids thinking about and talking about um, the stories that they're engaging with. Great, thank you so much, Trevor. Do you mind if I yeah. share? I actually have your book sitting in my lap. Can I share your access lenses? Absolutely, yep, yes. We'll put this up in the, um, the uh, resources we're gonna put up after, but within uh, Trevor's book is a great tool to um, do exactly what he's speaking about. And it's, it's great with kids, even younger, especially younger kids, because it's very easy to understand. It talks about the different ways to access mood visually, so. Yep. That, okay. And they're, they're uh, available for free through the Stenhouse uh, website. At, uh, if you Google the Art of Comprehension Stenhouse under resources, there's a free version. I will of add that, that, add that, that to document. Resources. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, now we're going to shift to Talia, if you're ready. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, let's share my screen and let's start this presentation. Uh, so a lot of this is going to be coming from the book that I co-wrote with uh, Dr. Merrill Jaffe Worth, A Thousand Words, and we're going to really be talking about using advertisements to transition um, into talking about graphic novels. Uh, the reason being that there are different, different media that use both visual and prose forms of communication do so in different ways. Um, comics and graphic novels are particularly complex. It's not just a single image with some um, lines. There is framing, there are panels, uh, there is a whole chart that we have as well that lists different things to be looking for. And so in order to kind of set the scene, start getting students thinking about images and the way that images, texts get together to convey a message, have a purpose, try to tell something, uh, we start by using advertisements. Uh, the nice thing about advertisements is there are so many, you can, you, you can really cherry pick the ones that you want that to be age appropriate, to either be commercial or could be public service announcements. Um, and you run from that. Um, so eventually you wanna ramp up to something like this, looking at this image, which is from the graphic novel Leica. Um, there's a lot of complexity here again. So use of choice of color. You notice in the bottom left-hand corner that it's mostly black and white. And okay, why is it mostly in black and white? And in that negative situation, looking at the shape and form of panels, there's, again, it's a lot of complexity. And to jump in, as you said, Tracy, um, from the very get-go, it can be really overwhelming. So step one, you introduce the elements of visual literacy. Um, it's one image, and there are fewer issues that you have to constantly monitor with your students. Coke has a lot of really good ads that are good for all ages. Um, it's, you can talk about health in this way, um, particularly the advertisement on the right. Talk about the fact that Coke is connecting itself with Olympians and the Olympics and what message are they trying to hide, which is that conception of Coke is not actually good for you, but look at this really healthy, really happy, vibrant, person. Um, 
you look at, for example, the choice of font in the ad on the left, what is that font doing? Um, look at how that font connects to the swiveliness of that chord. Um, and you start unpacking it. One thing, one thing that I like doing is also showing things that do it poorly. So this is taken from Scott McLeod's um, Twitter from 2018. And it's the pairing of images and text where the image makes no sense if you take it on its own. Um, one thing that is really great is ask students, okay, how might you misread this picture? Um, you know, in the event of fire, run into a box that is connected to chopsticks where there are a lot of smaller people in here. Um, and then might you do better? So basically using the ads, here is this activity that we've kind of put out, we've presented in our book. Um, and we really pivot from Smokey the Bear. The reason being that Smokey the Bear has been decades old. It's an evolving use of image and text for messaging. And for older students, you can talk about how has this messaging changed? How has the history you know, changed? How has Smokey changed? When um, I presented this at an edu educator's conference, we had a five to 10 minute conversation about the depiction of masculinity with Smokey the Bear and how that depiction has changed over time. It was utterly fascinating. Um, so with your students, you want to ask them what message is trying to be communicated, what part of the message is being communicated through image, color, text, the layout, the format, the you know, where we're looking from, our vantage point, and do you think this is successful? Why or why not? Um, and then again, here's a whole array of Smokey the Bear over time. So you see something like Smokey the park ranger who looks kind of like a bear to Smokey at 75, he's less buff, still kind of masculine, but less buff. He's a father now. He has all sorts of friends around him and it's a party. And so how is that different from perhaps the image next to it, our most shameful waste? Um, and you use that to open up this idea for more city kids, for example, um, who might not resonate as much with the concept of forest fires, this is a really interesting advertisement as well. It's actually seen in real life. Um, you look at steps, for some, this is the Everest. Um, talk about that, talk about the placement in the world, talk about how that image is interacting with you and your experience. And why are the words at the very bottom and you look up, what does that do emotionally when you're encountering it? Do you think this is successful? Why, why not? If not, how might you improve it? From there, you have students practice writing, designing, creating, and then critiquing their own ads. You want them to start creating because that creative process really helps teach you what to look for when you read images, when you read comics, when you read uh, graphic novels. And then you introduce graphic novels. Uh, you bring in all of the different elements that are found on a page. And this is a reproducible figure from our book that kind of shows using uh, one of Raina's books, Smile specifically. Um, and then you bring in there a book that is that you're going to be using. Um, a book that is appropriate for your students. Uh, so again, these are reproducibles, um, but you can certainly find your own. Um, and you can start talking about the panels, the size, the fact that none of the panels in figure 6.4 on the left is actually a square. Um, they're all quadrilateral, slightly off kilter, and what does that mean versus that circle? You can talk about the shape of the uh, dialogue balloons, that, you know, one is a circle and one is, I believe, hexagonal. Um, and then you compare it to, or you can talk about March, where most of the text in here is not really conventionally presented. 
in the way that you expect it to be in a graphic novel or in a comic book. Um, you can talk about black and white. You can talk about the biblical text that is presented in here, how it is within the body, behold the Lamb of God. Um, the fact that it imbues John Lewis means something, and you can talk about that. And you go into there and you take those pages out for a spin. And as a class, you critically read these graphic novels using, again, these different resources, these different points of perspective to help structure conversation. Um, the nice thing about all of this is because it's not rooted to a single, uh, a single text, it can really be modified to fit different age groups, different uh, classroom communities, different needs, different topics. Um, and from there, you get to really just roll your sleeves up and start to have fun with these texts that are fantastic. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. I look forward to seeing what else everyone has to say. Thank you so much, Tally. I appreciate it. And um, we'll post those slides afterwards as well. So you'll have access um, to that. And then highly recommend um, Marilyn Talia's book. It's excellent. Uh, OK, going next, I believe Shavetta, you are coming up next. Yes. I'm glad to follow Talia because I want to build and connect to a lot of what she showed us. Um, those those images, those iconic symbols that we saw on the on the sign, the stairwell, the, the case of emergency, the fire, the elevator um, from Scott McCloud's book um, reminded me of how I, re I read some new research that came out last year by Neil Kahn, who did a study about iconic representation. So those cartoonified images that we see on signs, Ikea instruction manuals. Um, he did a study to show that, that ended up showing that the interpretation of those really simplistic iconic images is actually not as universal as we would think. And I thought that was a really important reminder um, because so much of what we read about graphic novels is that accessibility. Um, everyone can participate. The Everyone understands what a circle with two dots and a half curve means, that that's a smiley face. So I thought this was really uh, compelling research that showed actually there are a lot of subtleties in the interpretation of even the most simplistic uh, ubiquitous images. And so I'm gonna show some activities that I do with students um, that connects with that idea. Uh, because, let's see here, let's go ahead and get into slideshow. Um, because of that, because we're all bringing our own experiences, different amounts of familiarity with graphic novels and comics uh, and, and looking at visual texts and talking about them, and also our own funds of knowledge, then that would mean that a simple drawn image would generate a variety of analysis and, and perspectives. So for that reason, over the years, I've come to rely more and more on a constructivist approach to studying graphic novels and comics in the classroom. So students are making meaning collaboratively in groups and or in pairs as they build that independence and uh, exposure to all the different ways and angles that someone can, can interpret an image. So this is an example of just one image um, in Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi. And an example of what this might look like in a group is that maybe it's three students and each one, um, I think like how Trevor talked about those uh, access lenses, each student might have a different access lens that they are looking at just that one panel through that lens. So we might have one student who takes some time independently to look at the one panel um, just in terms of the colors that are used. Here are some examples of notes that student might come up with. They're only looking at color. Another student uh, might be looking at just perspective. 
uh, in this case, uh, the student has come up with ideas about the fact that we actually don't see Margie, the main character here. Um, we're looking at her from above, from a bird's eye perspective. Um, they may also notice that uh, the view extends beyond the panel. A technique they learn is called a bleed. Um, and that the, the road actually narrows, the view narrows, the further it gets away from us. Um, and from there, they're gonna be able to collaboratively draw conclusions about, about these uh, access lenses they've, they've looked at. A third student may just look at that tension that Talia was describing between the words and the pictures. Um, because like Tracy mentioned, the person who read uh, Batman just looking at the words could not describe what happened in that story. Um, so what's important with, with looking at comics and graphic novels is that tension that's created between the words and pictures. And so we have one student in this group just devoted to looking at that. Um, and, and in that way, the student was able to notice the irony between actually, if you just read that caption, uh, and you imagined in your own mind what that might look like visually, most people would not have come up with the image that Satrapi shows here. So that immediately got her thinking about this sort of surprising juxtaposition between um, this caption that talks about fleeing a country because there's no future there, um, and then uh, Margie's family choosing to stay because they see that that's the only place where they have a future. Um, and so looking at the picture kind of shows, uh, uh, it doesn't clearly articulate that there's a future there for Margie in her perspective. So if everyone's looking at just one element of that panel, and then they can bring those interpretations together to make meaning and draw conclusions from what's shown, and maybe not draw conclusions, but um, open up new possibilities of what, of what this could mean. Um, I found that the, the interpretations that students come up with collaboratively far um, outweigh what they could have come up with on their own. So uh, following that, sometimes there is a page um, or a panel that is incredibly uh, mystifying to my students. So this is one page from Persepolis that, that year after year um, students struggle to make meaning from. You've got a lot of, uh, a lot of devices at play here. Um, her traditional um, use of black and white, but also we have Margie at different points in her life. We see her as a baby, we see her as a young child, we see her as an adolescent, um, all within one page. We're jumping across decades, um, maybe a decade. Uh, so, so when there is a particular page that I've observed as I circulate in the room and see students talking together, um, if I see them struggling to make meaning, um, we'll sometimes take that page, I'll throw it up on a chart paper, and I'll have different groups walk around at, different, uh, at a dedicated time and use different color markers to mark that page up. And they can, uh, they can ask questions, they can simply circle something that they don't understand, um, or they can uh, actually write something that they, that they did glean from that page. So as groups uh, continue to circle and look at that and revisit that page, they see, they actually see their, their thinking is visible to them. They see the collective thinking and are able to make meaning um, from there. Um, before students can really uh, meaningfully participate in a group, they need time to themselves uh, first to process the text or the visual or, or the question or the prompt. Um, so often we, the, a very common strategy is think, pair, share, or think, write, pair, share, where before you're asking students to actually communicate with a peer, give them that time to, to think on their own and maybe express that in writing. Um, when I've been teaching prose texts and poetry, I've often used uh, the, the um, reliable strategy of, they're either called dialectical journals, I started calling them active reading journals, where you might have a, a compelling quote uh, that a student picks out from their homework reading, and then some interrogation of that quote or response to it or analysis of it, and they sort of build their close reading skills with that. 
Um, well, that is also something you would want to do with, with comics and graphic novel reading. So I started calling those panel journals because I saw that over time, students were really uh, using these to, to record the panels that they really liked. Um, sometimes it wasn't for any greater purpose, but it was something like, wow, I really like, they couldn't even explain it early on, but they wanted to record a panel that made a strong impression on them. So sometimes in the panel journals are simply doing uh, text-based close reading, asking questions, making observations, drawing conclusions about what's happening in those panels, um, and in between the panels, that gutter space where we really have to fill in the story. Um, they are, getting ahead of myself there, um, maybe recording the panels that they want to follow up on, something that's particularly captivating to them or confusing, puzzling. And this is often where I get those ideas for that chart paper uh, gallery walk idea is I'll look in their journals and see patterns of which panels are really uh, uh, confusing students. And then um, they st I started, again, this was not something I assigned, but I started noticing this when I was looking at students' panel journals was not only were they recording the panels that captivated them, but they were trying to recreate them. Um, and that ended up becoming uh, basically a draft for the graphic novels they would end up creating themselves at the end of our study. So you can see here this student was inspired uh, by the technique seen in this panel uh, that we talked about earlier to create a similar visual to communicate a similar experience, which was that uh, he was moving to our high school in 10th grade, not knowing anyone or over 5,000 kids at that school. Um, so he used some of those same bird's eye perspective, um, intimidating towering building like the trees for Margie um, to, to communicate a, a, a similar experience. So those are just a few strategies. Uh, again, I think like Trevor mentioned, um, these are all things we would do with teaching any text. Um, and, and I do think that, that it's been helpful when I've worked with teachers to remind them that, that those same analysis and comprehension um, and discussion activities that they do with any text uh, lend themselves really well to graphic novels and comics. Great, Shavetta, thank you so much. I love seeing your students work in there, that's great. Um, if you wouldn't mind stopping your share screen, that would be great. And uh, I believe that we are on to Derek. Yes, we are. Let me get my share screen going here. Give me just a second. So my piece is going to be a little bit different uh, than what we have seen in that I am talking about something that I would uh, introduce to my students after having been introduced to uh, comics writ large. So we would have already done introductory work with panels and closure and, and things of that nature um, to get them introduced to the, the medium itself. Uh, what you're going to see today is a way for me in my classroom to bridge the medium to the more theoretical components of text-based literature that my students would be used to from nine or ten years of previous instruction in text-based literacy. Um, what I like to do in my class with comics is play with the similarities and the differences of the tools that are used by storytellers in visual texts and textual based texts and demonstrate to my students that those two are strikingly different in some ways, but generally play by a lot of the same or similar rules. Um, where we start with that is by using reader response literary criticism uh, to derive meaning. And I start by showing them a couple of panels. Let's see if I can get this to progress. There we go. A couple of panels from an issue of Black Widow. And this is all off of one comic page, but I've blacked it out so that there is a sense of progression at first. And I ask my students to consider where the story deviates from their expectations on this page. And invariably, it's that 11 panel at the bottom where the parents or some elderly people are revealed to be tied up downstairs. And that forces my students to backtrack and reconsider the story that they thought they were getting. Most of them believe this is just someone getting ready for school. They don't look terribly enthused. Maybe they have a test today. And then they get to that 11th panel 
and they have to reconsider what they thought they had seen. And that's just an interesting way for us to start talking about reader response criticism. Uh, the basic gist, as I introduce it to my students, is that texts don't have a meaning unless we give them one. Uh, the author has their impression of the meaning, the storyteller, and the storytellers in the case of comics with the writer and the inker and the penciler, have an idea of what they want to say, but until we, the reader, imbue our experiences and our interpretation to the text, the text is a blank slate for us. I also want to make sure that my students are aware of the text not only as a uh, sequence, but also as a simultaneous expression of image. So I'll show them something like this from Chabotet's Park Bench. Uh, this is a series of pages laid out in uh, some, some order and sequence from 1 to 22. And then if we read this, we get something akin to what you see now here on your screen, following the dark arrows and then the lighter arrows to get a sense of the chronology of these events. But we can also look at it as a simultaneous expression. And what we find is that we get a different experience off of the text if we read it all at once. We just kind of let our eye travel the page without any sense of proper chronology, remembering that in the case of a story that we are reading, we are in control of the story that we get out of it. There's the implicit idea of progression and then there's what we want to take from it thematically, or like Trevor was saying earlier, based on mood or uh, based on the use of color. From there, progressed on you, progressed there. Oh dear. From there, I give my students a couple of examples to play with. And this is where we would break into small groups and we would ask, what is happening here sequentially? And what do we take away from it? from a sense of meaning? Do we get a strong emotional response? Why? Is there something in our lives? Is there something in our experiences that resonates on these pages? How does that differ from person to person? Um, I've had students read this page and come back with a sense of curiosity. I've had students that uh, don't have terribly good experiences uh, or relationships with their parents respond uh, strongly to the, the, the third column, I guess you'd call it over here, where the uh, the, the parent is berating what appears to be their child for being late. And then I've had students focus more on the animal, uh, those that were uh, really attached to pets as a kid. Uh, really like that middle panel where the little girl becomes enamored with the snail. Same is true in the next set of images. Uh, many of my students don't respond terribly strongly to these, but those that live with their grandparents uh, or have strong connections to the elder, uh, elderly members of their family or community uh, see a lot of humor in what's going on here. In fact, I've had a lot of students compare this to like the Golden Girls. Uh, those that know that that show see a lot of similarity here. All this leads us to the question as we are reading Park Bench as a class, uh, what is it about? Uh, how does this text count on us to build the images? And this is where we bridge in to some, uh, some writing practice. I have them follow a summarized, generalized, synth synthesized practice where I ask them first to summarize to me based on their experiences and their read of the uh, section of the story that they've been given, what is happening here. And then I ask them to uh, shrink that down into a generalized idea of a, a theme or a message, a singular phrase. So their summary could have been as long as a paragraph or maybe even a page, the generalization is going to pare that down into a single statement. And then finally, with the synthesis step, I ask them to, difficult though it is, sum up the entirety of the section of the work that they've been given into a single word. And even the students that have been given the same page come up invariably with different interpretations of what that page is about. I find that the best way uh, to approach a textless comic like Park Bench or uh, like The Arrival is to approach it by highlighting that text is in itself just another image. It's just an image that we have decided has communal meaning. Uh, that's just a series of symbols in a particular order that we recognize as having a meaning only because we've given it one. And if that is the case, if language is as flexible as any image out there and it's only through a 
group think decision to imbue it with something larger than itself, then images should work in that same way. And I will stop sharing now. Derek, thank you so much. I'm just, my mind is spinning with all of the information that you've all provided and, and the new perspectives on this that I hadn't seen or thought of before. So I thank everyone for their expertise and their experience and for sharing um, with all of us. We are reaching the end of our time. So um, I just want uh, to let the audience know that if you look in the video description below, we will put links, a link to a page where you can find all of the resources that we've talked about today, um, how you can contact any of us, um, and uh, we very much appreciate all of you being here, and we hope that you enjoy reading comics and graphic novels with your students. Thank you. <laughs>